Let us pray. Almighty God in heaven, we, your imperfect mortals upon this fragile earth, we draw near to you now in prayer, asking that your Holy Spirit will again move among us, take up residence within each one of us, and speak to us anew of your truth and your mercy and your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Return to no man evil for evil. If it be possible, live peaceably with all. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr. Robert Finley. I am the fifth pastor of this vibrant and forward-looking congregation, a congregation that has always preached and been grounded upon the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. My father James was from Scotland. He came across the Atlantic at the invitation of his friend, Dr. John Witherspoon, president of the College of New Jersey, later renamed Princeton University. I was born in Princeton in 1772. I was a precocious child. Truth is, I was often bored while a student and knew more about the subject matter than my own teachers did. And so my boredom would sometimes get me into trouble. I enrolled as a freshman at the College of New Jersey at the age of 11. I graduated at age 16, became a grammar school teacher, traveling about a few states, then returned to the college to work as a teacher. Six years later, I was licensed by the Presbytery of New Brunswick. Two years after that, on June 17, 1795, I was ordained as a minister of the Word and Sacrament right here in this place and began my ministry as your pastor. I was 23 years old. I didn't have a wife or family. At the time of my arrival, there were 74 members of the Basking Ridge Presbyterian Church. It had been eight years since the last pastor had left. Talk about an interim period. <laughs> Because of that long and uncertain time, things were in disarray. The church was divided and disorganized, no clear records being kept. The session barely ever met. They kept no minutes. There was no clear sense of purpose or direction. As soon as I arrived, I got to work. Organizing, teaching, preaching, helping these dear people discover what it meant to be the church God was calling them to be. In 1798, I was married to my beloved Esther Caldwell. I served during good and vibrant years in the life of this church, one of the brightest periods in its entire history. In every way that you could measure growth, we grew. Newcomers arrived week after week and joined our church in one year alone, 1803. We took in 127 new members. We established a Sunday school program. At that point, such things hadn't existed. They hadn't been envisioned. What we began became a national model. Other churches across our land would follow us, helping their children to learn about the Bible and to learn about the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. We enlarged this sanctuary. We added 20 feet on one end and built 28 new pews on the ground level and 12 new pews up in the balcony. 
Friday evening lectures and prayer gatherings were begun. On Sundays, people brought their lunch to church. They would eat their lunch under the oak tree after morning worship and then come back and attend another service afterward. Such full days of devotion with prayers and sermons that were much more lengthy. It did not seem to weary those devout believers one bit. They said I was a preacher of great earnestness and power. I still remember one of those sermons I preached where I described the wrath of God as a boiling gulf toward which sinners were rapidly floating. And I shouted out to the people, stand back, stand back. Oh, sinners, let me push you away from this fiery deep. At that very moment, it was as if the entire congregation jumped halfway out of their seats as if to avoid the danger that I was warning them about. I preached not only in church, but in people's homes, traveling in the outer lying areas, in the mountain, in, down by the river, and in areas I would travel to taking two or three days to get there, sometimes in the snow or in the rain, driving myself to the point of exhaustion. The neighbors would assemble together all in one house and I would preach. I still remember one time where the crowd looked a bit weary before I'd even begun. I, I didn't think they'd have the stamina, the, the patience, the endurance to stick with me. And so I saw some loose boards up in the ceiling, some rafters. I tugged a few of them loose. I pulled them down, laid them upon chairs to make benches so that they might sit down. I, I thought if they were sitting instead of standing, they'd be able to stick with me even longer. My predecessor, Dr. Samuel Kennedy, a medical doctor, he established the Basking Ridge Classical School, holding lessons, tutorials, down at his 300-acre farm along the Passaic River. Through generous congregations, including our own, my family's contribution of $700. Just to the west of the sanctuary in that direction, we built the Brick Academy, building upon the foundation that Dr. Kennedy had begun. We taught Latin and the Greeks and the classics. We Presbyterians believe in a sound and well-trained mind. School attracted students from as far away as Philadelphia and the Carolinas and graduated many distinguished lawyers and, and judges, senators, and preachers. And during the final season of my ministry in 1816, I joined with my friend Bushrod Washington, beloved nephew of President George Washington, to organize the American Colonization Society. The group established the country of Liberia in Africa for free black Americans. You see, I was distressed with the way that free blacks were being treated in America. So many forces in our society were against them and were pushing them down and, and telling them a message other than the truth of who they were as children of God. Our aim was to help them to have a fresh chance in return to the continent from which they had been stolen. There were 1,500 free blacks right here in our community, many of whom worshipped here alongside us. My belief was that if our fathers brought them here, we are bound, if possible, to repair the injuries inflicted by our fathers. During the American Revolution, the British had freed a number of slaves and transported them back to Great Britain, then to Sierra Leone. And thanks to many generous philanthropists, it was a great success. Could not we do the same? At the time I wrote, could not the rich and benevolent devise a means to form a colony on some part of the coast of Africa, which might gradually induce free blacks 
to go and to settle, devising for them the means of getting there and of protection and support until they were established. The idea was well received here in Baskin Ridge. My friends encouraged me to go to Washington to gain support. I traveled there. I spoke with President Madison, Henry Clay, and others. As part of my presentation, I, I said to them, Happy America! If she should endeavor not only to rival other nations in arts and in amassing arms, but to equal and exceed them in the great cause of humanity, which has begun its never-ending course. I was met with success. Years later, Abraham Lincoln became a member of the society that Bushrod and I founded. Almighty God tells us that all people are created in His image and deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and honor. God tells us in Genesis, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the animals that creep upon the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so whether someone was born in Scotland, as my parents were, or in England, Germany, or France, here in the United States, or on the continent of Africa, they were due the same rights. They were due the same privileges. They were made in the same likeness of our Almighty God. At the completion of my pastorate here in Basking Ridge, our congregation included the whole of Bernard's Township, New Vernon, Stony Hill, Liberty Corner, Mine Brook, and Mendham. As no other church as yet, not a single one existed in that region. People came to church on foot, by horseback, or by farm wagon. During my 22-year ministry, I presided over 200 weddings. I officiated at 500 baptisms, including nine for my own children. Five little girls God blessed us with. Four boys, all of whom traveled to Princeton to study in the seminary. The youngest, God rest his soul, died while a student there. Even my father moved to Baskin Ridge while we served here. He became an elder, served on our session. It helped during some of those meetings. And he is buried in the old churchyard. In 1817, at age 45, I was called to become the president of the University of Georgia in Athens. It was with great reluctance that I submitted my resignation. It was with great reluctance that it was accepted. During my farewell sermon, I was so moved with emotion, moved by gratitude to God and to this incredible community of faith for the joy that it had been that I fell upon my knees while preaching and I remained on my knees until that sermon was over. Our two-week journey to Georgia was made in a sailing vessel. We sailed from New York Harbor to Savannah, Georgia. Provisions were sparse. The weather was rough. Upon arriving in Savannah, my wife and family and I and all our possessions were driven by carriage for a 200-mile journey that lasted an additional two weeks. The trip left all of us ill and shaken, and it got us to Athens, <coughs> a tiny village. They as of yet did not even have a church. 
There were but 28 students enrolled. Very few buildings, little in the way of equipment or a formal course of studies. And so I got to work. As I had some years later when I first arrived here, I got to work organizing the college churches, the, the college courses, helping to start and to build a small church. And then traveling throughout Georgia to raise financial support and recruit students. And on that trip, thoroughly exhausted, I succumbed to pneumonia and typhoid and passed away in November of that same year. How grateful I am for the gift of the life God gave me. There was no risk I would not take, no sacrifice that was too great. There was no hardship that I would shy away from in my unwavering desire to respond to God's call and carry out the mission of spreading the gospel to all the world. Not just with those who lived within easy walking distance of the great white oak, though I dearly loved that congregation, but with those who needed to be reached by horseback, by boat, by greater effort or lengthy journey, by any means necessary to reach them, to meet them, and to minister to them on behalf of the Christ who created me and redeemed me and who empowered me to share his great story with them. And so in closing, I say to you, in your life, follow the way of Christ as I did in mine. In your life, where there is darkness, bring light. Where there is despair, bring hope. Where there is oppression and exploitation and injustice, be a force for righteousness. Be a force for the dignity and the value of all God's people, not just those who were born in the land where your parents came from, but the dignity and the justice, the honor due to all God's people, whatever land they or their parents may have come from. As our brother, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the church in Rome, Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Persevere in prayer. Distribute to the needs of the people. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with them who rejoice. Weep with them who weep. Recompense to no man evil for evil. If it be possible, live peaceably with all. I say, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.